Who are you going to call when you want to play Ghostbusters with a light gun at home? Hey everyone, welcome back to Technically Not a Technician. Today, I'm walking you through how to get Ghostbusters running on Technoparrot, step by step. We'll start with a simple mouse and keyboard setup, then move to a standard game controller and finally bring out the big guns, literally, with the Sindon light gun. But first, a quick word from legal. This video is for educational purposes only and is only intended to show you what I've done and what my results are. If you choose to modify your systems using this or any other information I've provided from any video or content I've created, you do so at your own risk. I, this channel, or any person connected to this video will not be held liable for any choices you make with your hardware or software. Modify at your own risk. We'd also like to remind everyone that we don't support software piracy and that we're assuming that you've installed TechnoParrot and its needed dependencies, registered a free account, and set up a subscription. If you haven't, don't be scared. I made videos on that info, and I'll link to them above and in the description. We'll now flawlessly transition to our desktop, and here we'll find our compressed Ghostbusters ROM file. We'll expand the compressed ROM file to the right side of the screen using a free compression utility called 7-Zip. We'll then open and expand a folder to the left side of the screen. Using our folder on the left, we'll navigate to where I've stored my TechnoParrot ROMs. For me personally, that is in the directory of TechnoParrot itself. Once everything is in place, simply drag and drop the Ghostbusters ROM folder into the ROMs directory. Transfer times will depend on the hardware you're using, so transfer speeds will vary. I am using older hardware, and my hardware took about 16 seconds to transfer the ROMs to the correct directory. After the transfer is completed, we can minimize our ROM folder and close out the 7-zip utility. When done, if you wish, we can delete the compressed ROM file, as we'll only need the extracted files that we've placed in the ROMs folder. We now need to boot TechnoParrot. I'd recommend using an up-to-date build, and with your up-to-date build booted, you'll want to navigate to the hamburger menu at the top left of the TechnoParrot program and click on it. Upon doing so, a new menu will appear, prompting us to select the Add Game option. Doing so will present us with a list of all the arcade cabs that are compatible with Techno Parrot. We'll want to scroll down and find the Ghostbusters arcade ROM. When we find it, we will look for the Add Game option on the right side of the Techno Parrot program and we'll click it. Doing so will kick us back to our arcade library, where we'll find that the Ghostbusters arcade has been added and we should see an icon and arcade submenu on the right side of the Techno Parrot program. From this menu, find the Game Settings option and click that option. We'll now be moved to the Game Settings menu, and at the top of this menu, we'll be asked to find the arcade software's executable. Techno Parrot will give you a hint in the form of the executable's name in brackets at the top. All we need to do is navigate to the arcade ROM folder, find the executable, and point TechnoParrot to it. Once we've located the executable, highlight it and click on Open at the bottom of the screen. We'll now move down the list and see if there are any changes that we want to make. I will be taking mine out of window mode, and when I am done and I have no other changes I wish to make, we'll click on the Save option at the bottom right. Doing so will kick us back into the previous menu, and here we'll want to click on the controller setup option. First, we'll set up Player 1's Proton Pack and tell TechnoParrot that we'll use the Windows mouse cursor for it. Then we'll set the Arcade Test button to the number 9 key on our keyboard. The Arcade Service will then be the number 0 key. We'll set both coins to the 5 and 4 keys. The volume up and down will be bound to the plus and minus keys, and the trigger and reload will be bound to the left and right mouse keys. Upon completion, we must select the Save Settings option from the menu's bottom. Next, we simply need to click on the launch game so we can demo this arcade. 
The cab took about 18 seconds to launch and we'll jump ahead just a little to save time. Upon booting the cab, a service screen will appear, prompting you to calibrate the left proton pack first. Once you've done so, we'll activate the trigger, prompting you to calibrate the right. As you recall, we have not set up the right proton pack, which belongs to player two. To exit this menu, we will press the nine key, which is bound with the arcade test button. I've not tested it yet, but I believe setting up and calibrating both proton packs will make this service screen go away when booting up. So, a few things. First, clearly I forgot to move my keyboard. That's my bad. Furthermore, I'm sure that you can see that our screen is jumping about kind of like a toothless meth head. The problem stems from the recording, not the arcade itself. In truth, the arcade demoed very well, and we encountered zero issues during gameplay. Because this recording sucks so bad, we'll be quickly moving on. The important takeaway here is that with a mouse and keyboard, this game is very playable. After exiting the arcade, let's get into the game settings menu, and here we're going to change our input API from raw input to X input. After we've made these changes, we'll need to move to the bottom and click the Save Settings option. Once we save our settings, the previous menu will reappear, prompting us to navigate to the controller setting menu. Here, we'll first bind our arcade test and service buttons to the up and down buttons on the controller's D-pad. I'll next bind the coin to the controller's back button. The volume up and down will be bound to the D-pad's right and left buttons, the Proton Pack's trigger will be the left mouse, and the reload will be the right. I'll now set up the Proton Pack's X and Y axis, and to do so, I'll be using the X and Y axis on my controller's left thumbstick. Once I've finished setting up my controller, I'll click the Save Settings option at the bottom. The previous menu will reappear, prompting us to select the Launch Game option. Doing so will launch an arcade, and we'll start the booting sequences. I'll skip ahead to save us some time. After once again seamlessly transitioning into our demo of the arcade, we see that the video recording quality has improved a tremendous deal, with only a few jumps now and again. These small jumps are, again, due to the recording and not the game. I also feel now is the time to say that I'm not good at light gun games using a controller like this, so any gameplay issues will be my fault, not the game's. The controller really is responsive and works very well. I'm able to demo the arcade's Proton Pack well. Our trigger control seems to be on point, and I've got no issues to report. Once again, I find that this style of game and this type of controller do not appeal to me. However, I am not you, and this type of controller paired with this kind of game might appeal to you. If that's the case, I can report that this combo works well and will give you an enjoyable time. Let's take a moment to transition into the Sindon light gun. I must say, I thoroughly enjoy demonstrating light gun games using a Sindon light gun. However, because of the nature of emulation and emulation controls, some games appear to play more natively with the Sindon than others do. For instance, Terminator Salvation is a fantastic example of an arcade running well with a Sindon, and I assure you I'm not exaggerating when I say Star Trek Voyager performed better on the Sindon than it did on a standard controller or using a keyboard and mouse. Unfortunately, our experience with the Ghostbusters arcade did not match those positive results. In both of the previously mentioned examples, all we have to do is turn the Sindon on, start its software, load the Sindon border, and run those arcades in full-screen window mode under Techno Parrot. Ghostbusters seems to have limitations that I'm guessing have something to do with it being a Linux-based cab and its supported screen resolutions. In short, this arcade will run in window mode, but for whatever reason, you can't expand this window to full screen, and the window seems to be set to that of the arcade's native resolution. That said, you can disable Windows mode and demo the arcade in full screen. However, 
Doing so will disable the Sindon software's ability to display a border, and the absence of the border will keep the Sindon from working as designed. How can we add a border to ensure that the Sindon functions as intended? That is a wonderful question, and for the answer, I've turned to Sindon's wiki page. It has a ton of information and has pointed me to a third-party app called Reshade, and based on my limited experience with Reshade, I can say it seems to work flawlessly with the Sindon hardware and software. I'm not going to get into a Sindon or Reshade guide today, as those subjects will need their own videos. I will say that if you'd like a setup guide for the Sindon or Reshade, hit me up in the comments, and if it is requested by enough people, I'll make it. The short version is that Reshade is designed to let you place borders, overlays, bezels, and the like on top of your display. Much like a custom heads-up display, and we'll obviously be using Reshade to add a white border that the Sindon hardware and software can use to help us demo this arcade and guide our controls. With Reshade in place and providing us our needed white border and our Sindon controller configured in the Techno Parrot software, we can enjoy our game. I want to emphasize that I am recording the screen using Open Broadcast Studio and I am also using older hardware which causes a slowdown when playing this game. When not using OBS, there is no slowdown. I think the delay may also be partly due to the fact that I am playing in 4K while recording in 1080p. As it turns out, the old free office hardware I'm using has limits, and we are hitting them. When demoing this game and not recording it, Ghostbusters plays much better and with no delay. I'd also like to point out that because of my recording space, I am a bit closer to the screen than I'd like to be. Generally, when using the Sindon, it's best to be away from the TV. This gives you better accuracy and better gameplay. The other thing I'd point out would be the Terminator 2 cab playing in the background. The Terminator 2 cab has a Sindon border on its screen, and if it is placed next to the other screen, the side-by-side -side Sindon borders can cause accuracy issues. This is all a classic case of do as I say, and not as I am doing. I believe it can be said that while filming this demo, I had to make some concessions regarding the available space and the time I have for this project. Despite the limitations and being positioned a bit too close to the screen, this setup remains very playable. I almost feel like I can't lose when I'm not using OBS and when I'm standing at the right distance from the screen. In this arcade game, gameplay immerses you in scenes that are primarily based on the original movies, where you must eliminate several generic ghosts in each scene before facing a boss ghost. After defeating the boss ghost, you get to play for a bonus in the form of defeating the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. At an arcade, this cab can be set up to win tickets if the arcade operator wishes, and if you defeat Stay Puffed, you can win up to 500 tickets. The arcade's gameplay repeats itself, each time giving you a new scene, most of the time directly out of the movies, making you feel as if you're a real Ghostbuster. Admittedly, this game brings back fond memories for me. Since the 1980s I've wanted to be a Ghostbuster, and this game lets me play the part well. And so, after all that, what is our final verdict on playing the Ghostbusters arcade game at home? Let's break it down. We started with the baseline, the classic mouse and keyboard. For a game like this, it's a surprisingly effective setup. It offers precision, it's immediately accessible to everyone, and makes the game entirely playable with absolutely no fuss. It is the perfect entry point. Next, we moved to the standard game controller. For many, this will be the most familiar and comfortable way to play, and it is very responsive. While I mentioned it wasn't my personal preference for this style of game, I can report that the controls are solid and will absolutely provide an enjoyable and hassle-free experience. And that brings us to the main event, the Sindon Light Gun. This is, without a doubt, the reason we're here. As you can see from this footage, 
if you want the most authentic, immersive, and downright fun way to bring the arcade experience home, the Sindon light gun is truly in a class of its own. Yes, it requires that extra step with reshade to get it running perfectly in full screen, but when you're blasting ghosts, racking up tickets, and taking on the stay puffed bonus round like this, it is absolutely worth the effort. There's really nothing else quite like it. So, who are you gonna call? For my money, it'll be with a light gun in my hand, every single time. That is all for this one. This was a fun project, and if you'd like to see those dedicated setup guides for the Sindon or Reshade that I mentioned, be sure to let me know down in the comments. I do read all of them. And I must say, projects like this are the reason I started this channel. It's a blast to dive into the technical details, solve a few problems, and get these incredible arcade experiences working perfectly at home. It wouldn't be possible without your support, so again, thank you. Until the next project, keep on tinkering. Thank you for watching and we'll see you on the next one.